The Post and Courier's Tony Bartel has exposed everything from corrupt politicians to the foods that we eat. I sit down one on one with Tony for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and download my free Quentin's Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Tony Bartel, it is so good to see you here on Quentin's Close Ups. Oh, it's great to be here, man. I appreciate it greatly. Obviously, you are one of the award-winning reporters here at the Post and Courier. And in fact, I know TED Talks brought you on earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And they said this about you. Obviously, you've earned top awards and recognition for your climate change stories, and including your book, Every Other Breath in Chasing Carbon. Tony is the leading charge to bring awareness to topics no one else is talking about. In this case, plankton and the threat to our auction on Earth. When he's not exposing climate threats, Tony is shining a light on government corruption and other global conflicts for the Post and Courier as a special projects reporter. Who else is Tony these days? <laughs> Who else? Well, I, you know, I, I wear many hats as a project reporter here when I do, you know, a range of, of things, everything from, you know, corrupt sheriffs to, uh, I did a story about you know why it's so bad to eat bacon? Oh yes, I saw that. <laughs> I just had bacon yesterday. Yeah, oh, but uh, that was a kind of a bum, a bum people out. But it was important because right. it gets to the heart of why everybody's getting all these chronic diseases. Sure. So, so there, and you got corrupt sheriffs. Oh, yes. uh, we've been, you know, exposing injustice to me is like the most important thing I can do as a journalist. Sure. So, I'm a privilege to do that here. Exactly right. And obviously, you know, as a free time Pulitzer Prize finals and offer, you obviously, as I mentioned, uncovered co complex stories that strike a chord within the local community and beyond. And during your spare time, obviously you're working on becoming a, a magnificent triathlon. Oh. <laughs> but let me get back to obviously with the complex stories. Yeah. What complex stories are striking a chord with this community right now? So I think uh, climate related stories are really, really important to the, literally to the, the future of the city. So our story, but climate change stories are also very complicated and kind of a little bit of a challenge to create in a new way. So, so people actually are interested in it. So people already kind of know about the basic science and they don't want to get hit over the head with it. So I try to find stories that are a little unusual and then kind of help inform readers in a new way, kind of create some new neural pathways in their minds. That's exactly right. Yeah. And what stories are those right now in your mind? Well, I think that, so the plankton story was, was one of them. Um, so who's, so that's a real challenge, right? Plankton, you know, people know plankton basically as a character on SpongeBob, right. you know, <laughs> um, but then, you know, if you dig into this stuff, you realize that plankton produce half of the oxygen on earth, they produce every other breath. And if something's happening to our oxygen producers, hey, that's a big deal. And something is happening to our oxygen producers. So I had to um, just kind of fold in all that science in a way that isn't sort of threatening and kind of a bummer. And so we did this story every other breath, and we really kind of kind of crafted a mystery, we made it a mystery story, so people would be um, sort of seduced into the story okay. instead of you know kind of oh that's not a, another. Bummer climate change story. <laughs> climate change story. I know when I interviewed you for Quintus Close Ups for the special edition doing TED Talks in April, yeah. you basically said climate change is an ongoing emergency. Why is this emergency still ongoing in your mind? Yeah, I mean this is a this is is a the most important issue facing humanity right now. And people don't really you know, there's not that kind of sense of urgency to take action to address it as to, that would match the threat. So, so people are not doing the kinds of things that would reduce the kind of the carbon emissions that kind of are responsible for the climate um, rapidly warming, and, and, and action needs to be taken. So there is there is this sort of invisible threat, but people are kind of treating it as a long term, way way distant threat. Distant threat. Yeah. Action. I know you are a journalist, but if you could write a letter in the letter in, in, to the editor form to many of the lawmakers right now, what would you say about climate change? So, so you know, you know it's very frustrating for people, I think, because it's frustrating for me. Um, what, what can we do? What can I do as a person mm -hmm. about this sort of big problem? Well, it, there's a lot, really, and, and but it does it. 
and it really goes to the political arena. And that letter would be like, hey, we need to get serious about renewable energies and solar power. We need to kind of do the things that would encourage the growth of solar energy that will also transform our transportation system toward more electric vehicles and things like that. So basically, we found that, you know, we create all these fires when we're burning fossil fuels, when we're burning really, really old plankton. And if we can put out those fires, then we can really solve the problem. And to do that, we need to electrify, replace fossil fuels with clean burning, clean, not clean burning, but clean energy. Clean energy. But then what is the state of public transportation in your mind? You know, in South Carolina, it's terrible. You know, you ever tried to ride a car to bus anywhere? It's really, it's a challenge. Um, and, and I have, and it's, it's, you know, it, it, they're not frequent. Um, they're not, they don't go to the places you really need to go. So there's a, and there's no real good commuter system right now. Their car is talking about it. Um, and there's some potential there. Potential. So, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity for, for something to happen. Better bike paths and things like that uh, would be helpful. Helpful. Yeah. And you talked about plankton. What the, what headline would you write about that today? I'd say, well, you know, what's more important than every other breath? Mm -hmm. I know that obviously you investigate beauty sometimes. Mm -hmm. When you look at the beauty of the low country right now, yeah. what goes to your mind? I think you know, beauty is, you know, we, we don't talk enough about beauty, do we? I mean, it's... You know, we talk a lot about stuff in the, you know, a lot of negative stuff in the political arena and all that. But, you know, here we are, you know, in this very, you know, this beautiful world, this beautiful low country. And, you know, that's sort of what we need to kind of keep in mind. That's what's at stake. At stake. I know something that I, that is also at stake that is, is rising sea levels in South Carolina. Yeah. How much are the levels rising right now as we sit here? So we've had a foot, uh, a, a foot of sea rise in the last hundred years. And all signs are sh showing that that pace, that that rise, that increase will accelerate and has been accelerating. And we can just look anecdotally in the last year or two, we've seen a significant increase in sunny day flooding. And that's sort of, you know, when the when the um, tides are higher than normal, right. higher than expected. Sure. And then all of a sudden water appears, it gurgles through the storm drains and appears in our streets. Um, on a sunny day, and we're seeing that more and more often. We're, we're seeing record number, uh, record number of, of sunny day flooding in, in South Carolina, and that should be the canary in the coal mine. That's telling you something's going, something's going on. Something's going on, and I know obviously when you talk about plankton and climate change, you talk about social responsibility. Yeah, what is that? Social responsibility. Well, I think that's sort of taking action, looking at the world, and then um, owning it, and then. And then finding some solutions. And that, that, the, the thing is, so there's a lot of hopelessness about climate change because it's such a big problem, but there's also just a tremendous amount of potential. Potential. Yeah. And I know, obviously, there are a lot of climate threats right now. What are those exact climate threats that keep you up at night? I, you know, I'm not so worried about a lot of things like plastics and some of the other things that the big thing is what's making our entire atmosphere change and our the, the chemistry of our ocean change and so the thing that keeps me up our, at night is the record amount of carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere we've never had in in, in millions of years we've not had as high a level as carbon uh, as we do now of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere the last time it was that high um, it was much, much warmer. Much, much warmer. Yeah. And speaking of which, the ocean plankton, how do you view that right now? So the, the, so the ocean plankton is, is a fascinating um, subject to dive into because the, the plankton, you know, they crank out all this oxygen um, and they actually, some of them like warm water. Mm. But with all this heat that we're injecting into the ocean because of all this greenhouse gas stuff, um, it's creating a warm layer of water on the surface and it's preventing the nutrients from the colder ocean depths from reaching those oxygen producers. And so without those nutrients, those oxygen producers starve just like a plant without fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what 
you know, so I view the you know these these sort of oxygen producers as the canary in the coal mine. Mm. What else are you briefing in these days when it comes to ideas? Well, we, you know, I'm always looking for ideas that the people aren't really, you know, diving into. So I, I look for stories that are sort of hidden pl in plain sight. That's sort of my my thing, you know. And sometimes it's a corrupt politician trying to hide his his bad things uh, that he's doing. Sometimes it's uh, an issue like this this uh, this story I did about nutrition. Oh yes, <laughs> you know, that, you know, this was a you know an entire area of science that hardly anybody was talking about, despite mm. its connections to Alzheimer's and diabetes. Mm. And um, and yeah, it was a um, and it. People um, really responded to that because that's something they could actually do. They can they can take action. They know a little more. They can lay off the bacon a little bit. Right. They lay off the fried <laughs> foods. The soda. All, all this stuff we know is bad for us. Yeah, donuts and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All that sugar and all that. We all kind of know that, but this with this story that I kind of delve into explains why the mechanics. Mm. And you know, with that, readers can have a little bit of. They can make better decisions. Sure. When you were writing that story and it was published and everybody came to you with feedback about what they shouldn't be eating after this, yeah. what are those foods that you looked at and say, hey, I shouldn't be eating this either? Yeah, so, so it, you know, it, it, all the time you hear, like, oh, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat that. Well, we all kind of know the bad foods, mm -hmm. the junk foods, right. you know. So, <laughs> so fried food. Yes. Bacon, oh, yeah. you know, don't have so many hamburgers. Right. It's all about moderation. You know, you can eat bacon, you can have a hamburger now and then, but just you know, if you eat a lot of that stuff all the time, every day, right. basically your blood gets sticky. Mm. And and when your blood gets sticky, your body's immune system goes haywire. It, it becomes inflamed. So you have that inflammation. And so all these sort of chronic diseases like you know, diabetes are related to inflammation, mm -hmm. you know, Alzheimer's, oh, yeah. um, cardiovascular stuff. Sure. So, um, yeah, so all these inflammation related diseases. So that all this, you know, you want to keep your blood non-sticky. Sticky. That's right. <laughs> don't eat fried food. No, not at all. I, I got on my mom about that the other day when I went for a run. Like, don't eat breakfast sandwiches at eight in the morning. <laughs> right. Yeah. Obviously, you had your TED talk about plankton in April. Yeah. If you could go back. To the TED Talks right now, right. and basically talk to the audience about your career. How would you sum it up? So I would say, um, you know, I've had you know journalists um, don't make a lot of money. Um, job security is not so great, um, but you get this amazing passport into people's lives. You get a passport to uh, explore things you never thought you needed to know about, and so in that regard. Um, just feel very lucky to be doing what I'm doing. Doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And what would your TEDx talk title be? Oh, maybe exploring the stories that are hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the next one. <laughs> 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 well, Tony Bartelm, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome to Quentin's Close Ups. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, well, yeah, good talking with you. Likewise. Thank you.